Welcome to the, to the inaugural um, Walls lecture for this season. I, I gather this is the 28th season. Um, it's, it's not exactly the normal place and time, but this year will be 2 o'clock, and it'll be in this room and online as it, as it usually is. So we hope to see you all in future weeks as well. Um, and uh, it's a real pleasure uh, for Lambda Lunch, which is an interest, prokaryotic interest group at, at NIH, to welcome Jill Banfield to give this first lecture. Um, this is also the, the, Roland Di the Rolla Dyer lecture, um, which apparently has been going on since 1950, uh, well before Wall started. Um, and that lectureship honors a former NIH director uh, who is an authority on infectious disease. So each year, the Dyer Lecture is presented by an internationally renowned researcher who has contributed su substantially to biological knowledge of infectious disease and, in this case, microbes in all the <laughs> places we find them. Each year, Lambda Lunch, along with other interest groups and people all over NIH, nominates speakers. Uh, Lambda Lunch solicits nominations from our, our many members. Uh, and we vote, and Jill was at the top of the list, I think, not just this year, but this year we got, or last year when, when the invitations went out. So we're really delighted that she could come and, and give this talk. Um, she, started, she started her education in Australia, where she comes from, came to Maryland, to, to Hopkins, for a PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences, moved to the University of Wisconsin, um, and was uh, on faculty there until 2001 when she moved to UC Berkeley. This is her first trip to, to NIH, so we thought it was, it was much overdue. Um, maybe that's not so surprising given sort of the, the fields she comes from uh, historically, and I think all of us understand that some of the best science comes out of people from one field moving into others or, or lending their expertise and their different ways of looking at problems to another field. So she comes to us from, from, from Earth and Planetary Sciences, where she got her PhD, um, and, the, and the departments she's in now in, in Berkeley are Material Sciences and Engineering, Earth and Planetary Sciences, Environmental Science Policy, and Management. So not what we usually get to hear, but that's better yet. Um, her work has really, uh, on natural uh, microbial communities, has, has really spanned the, from uh, extreme environments to the infant gut. She's done a lot of work on the tree of life. Um, she's been r recognized with a long list of honors, uh, some of them in geochemistry, some of them in microbiology, some in just everything, um, including election to the National Academy of Sciences and the UK's Royal Society. So for those of you who want to hear more after today's lecture, there is a Lambda Lunch tomorrow um, in Building 37. It will also be online. If you don't know, that's at 11. If you don't know where and when that is or need the link, email me, Susan Gottesman, and I'll send it to you. Um, and today's lecture is obligate symbionts and other intriguing members of human microbiomes. And I'm delighted to welcome Jill to NIH. Okay, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Thank you, Susan, for inviting me and, and others who are involved in the invitation, and Chris for managing all of the arrangements. I really wondered about the wisdom of all this travel at this time, but I hadn't been to NIH before, and I'm like, this is, I just got to go. So it's been great to be here so far. I've met all sorts of interesting people, and I hope I'll get to meet more of you um, in the next day. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm an earth scientist. I am really interested in the environment and environmental challenges of climate change in biogeochemical cycles and in microbial roles in those, because after all, the earth's biogeochemical processes are run by microbes. So today I'm going to talk to you at NIH about a topic that crosses between earth science and the human microbiome. But I wanted to start out by saying that the connection between microbiology and earth processes has 
been in place since the very beginning of life on Earth. And obviously, Earth processes such as mantle degassing and the appearance of oceans, um, chemical weathering changed the Earth's environments and provided opportunity for biology, but then biological innovation fed back with changes in the environment, and so those things cycled over and over and over again, over and over and over time. The biggest innovation we all recognize was the appearance of oxygenic photosynthesis, which fundamentally changed the landscape of life um, at the Earth's surface. And um, following that, we have appearance of eukaryotes and the diversification of eukaryotes with punctuated changes marking the geologic timescales, reminding us actually that all of geology, all of the geosciences was founded on biology by the paleontological record. So lots of major mass extinctions and evolutionary innovation associated with geological events. So actually this sort of frames the topic I'm going to talk about today. When we look at this cartoon, we can see that there's this systematic change in life's macroscopic diversity, and of course, along with this came changes in the microbial consortia that inhabit those organisms. And so, as we look to the more recent time period, we might ask, where did the organisms come from that colonized animal bodies? And the most tractable part of that question would have to be this last part, where the colonization has happened recently and involved humans. And in parallel with this, I included a picture of a phylogenetic tree. I'll talk a little bit about this tree again in a moment, but as I'm sure you will realize, you know, the origin of life would be somewhere in here and all living things at the tips of the branches. So all these branches of organisms that appeared across domain bacteria and archaea, of course, come from the full diversity of environments, including um, animal and human microbiomes. So this is the question that I'm currently rather interested in. Where do the organisms that colonize the human body come from? Do they differ substantially from the organisms that exist in the environment? And assuming so, how do they differ? How often were there transitions from the environment into the human body? And I think a corollary of that will be the opposite direction, but we're not working on that yet. And then finally, what was involved in habitat transition? What processes occurred? When did they occur relative to the, the colonization event? So I'm working almost exclusively in ways that are founded on genome resolved metagenomics. I'm going to explain this, though I think probably many of you are familiar with the basic idea. Maybe not all, because I know a lot of people do sort of laboratory cultivation, isolation, genetics, and, um, biochemistry. This is a kind of parallel approach. It's something that I began working on right at my very early start in microbiology around the year 2000. Uh, we embrace the idea of complexity. As earth scientists, that's fundamental to us. We know we have to do with complexity. We just do the best we can to sort it out. And so we, by capturing the complexity, have the opportunity to understand a lot of the interactions and associations that would be missed in, in pure culture work. And most important, we can study organisms that are not available in pure culture, including phages and viruses. So the approach just starts simply with collection of a sample that represents the whole microbial community. We then extract the DNA, we fragment it. Most of the work we've done has been uh, with short reads. In early days, Sanger reads, more recently, mostly Illumina sequence data. Those short reads are assembled into contiguous genome fragments that are then binned by some bioinformatic algorithm or series of algorithms. Um, the bins are taken to represent partial genomes, draft genomes. Some of those draft genomes will come from non-chromosomal elements, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those today and more in the land lunch tomorrow. And then there's the possibility that we can um, improve those draft genomes and ultimately achieve genome completion. Now, this is not very often performed, and I'll talk again about this tomorrow in a little bit more detail, but it is possible, and it's actually really important for some of the work that I'll tell you. I'm not going to tell you what went into it. It's quite tedious at this time, but it's super important if we had to have reliable sequences. So often I get the, the kind of comment that, well, what can you really learn from metagenomes? Genomes from metagenomes are just nothing, and all you really should be working with is experiments. Well, I totally don't believe that, and I think now the data are accumulating that we can begin to have confidence in some of the kinds of inferences we can make from genome sequences from environmental samples. 
And so um, I again present this tree of life that we rendered in 2016, or published in 2016, which was intended to capture a sense of the diversity of life that had come to light through genomes from metagenomes. So this is based on genomes, not marker genes. And the genomes at the time were coming from all of Earth's environments, especially terrestrial environments. It had been very little studied to date. And what we realized uh, through construction of this tree, capturing all this diversity, is that the majority of lineages in domain bacteria and archaea are not represented by organisms in pure culture. And so these dots represent approximately phylum level lineages, each red dot, and each red dot means that that lineage has no isolated representative. So this means that we're leaving out in cultivation-based studies a huge majority, actually, of life's diversity in presumably biochemistry and genetics. One of the features that really stands out on this tree and the tree we'd made previously in 2015 is this collection of organisms from lineages that have no isolated representatives. This is a monophyletic group. Um, in the tree, pretty much everyone who makes these trees finds the same result, and all of the organisms have no isolated representative. The genomes are all small, if not very, very small. A symptom that we predicted would mean that the cells would be tiny. So here we have a prediction from the genomes. By filtration through a 0.2 micron filter, we showed we could enrich those organisms. Now, a lot of surveys, including the, the Global Ocean Survey run by Craig Venter, captured cells onto a 0.2 or even 0.4 micron filter. These go through. So they're really at life's minimum theoretical size. And this has been shown not only by filtration-based enrichment by cryo-TEM. We also can predict from the genomes that the cells should have an S layer, a surface proteinaceous layer, and pili, something we can directly visualize with cryo-TEM and tomography. Not this is just a a slice. Based on the genetic repertoires of these organisms, we predicted that they would be symbionts, obligate symbionts. And because of the kinds of environments they came from, in part, we suggested that they were probably symbionts of, uh, of other microbes. And this is really a contrast to most symbionts known, particularly at that time, which were uh, microbial symbionts of eukaryotes. So this is actually something that we know a lot more about now through co-cultivation studies and for additional, from additional um, cryo-TEM of select environmental samples. And just to give you a sense of these associations, in the top left-hand corner, and I apologize, it's a bit hard to see, we have kind of the roadmap for this slide. Now, ignore the most prominent feature, which is the film that is the support grid. That net is just the support grid. Focus on this big gray blob, which is a single microbial cell of normal size. In B, we've expanded the view of this, and what we can see is attached to the surface of this host cell is a chain of cells undergoing cell division. The cell size is around 0.2, 0.3 microns in diameter, so really, really tiny cells. Again, we can see through these cryo-TEM data, many pili um, surrounding the cell, as well as penetrating through the cell wall of the host, indicating a mechanism for communication, which is something that also can be um, deduced from the genomes, from metagenomes. So I'm going to talk today about the organisms that colonize the human body, but also have representatives in the environment, focusing on those lineages for which we don't have a lot of data from isolate-based studies. And in the CPR, this, I should say this, let's go back here a second. This is the CPR, candidate viral radiation. These tiny episymbionts. We have three lineages that are routinely encountered in the human. Saccharibacteria, bacteria, previously known as TM7, gracilli bacteria, and, which was BD15, and abscondida bacteria, SR1. And I'll just refer to them with their full names from here on. As we look across Earth's environments, a selection of Earth's environments, we find that these organisms occur at relatively low abundance, sort of in the 1%, sometimes to the 10% maximum level. But this is actually not to say that they're rare, comparatively speaking, because in many of these complex environments, the most abundant organism is only 1% of the sample. We also see that the blue dots for Saccharibacteria bacteria are more numerous 
than the other dots, indicating that these are the most commonly encountered group of these candidate phyloradiation or CPR bacteria. If we zoom in on the animal-associated groups, we find that they are found in two main environments, both in humans and in other animals, um, in the gut and in the oral cavity. So others have worked on this, and I want to um, acknowledge the work of the Forsyth Institute, which has been absolutely groundbreaking in terms of understanding this kind of symbiosis in the human body. So this is a paper by Bohr et al. from the Forsyth Institute, which really is a, one of a series of papers that definitively showed that Saccharia bacteria in the oral cavity are episymbionts of actinobacteria. So now we have a host microbe episymbiont pair. And again, we show images. In this case, these images from their paper indicate the Saccharia bacteria as red tiny dots compared to the big, big, big actinobacterial cells. These are two um, fluorescence and situ hybridization images. And then on the third slide, third image, we can see a scanning electron microscope image. And I don't know why this is a little dark, but you can see here these great big things. Those are the actinobacteria. And these are these episymbionts that decorate these cells. This is a cryo-TEM image that, that um, a member of my lab took with a culture from the Forsyth Institute in, in a collaboration with them. And it just gives you a slightly more detailed view, closer up view of this association. You can see the tip of the actinobacteria here. I'm just going to highlight it so you can see it. And then the tiny little episymbiotic cell. So, I'm not going to dwell on this. This is not our work, but I want to assure you at NIH that these organisms probably do have medical significance. There are others working on this. There are indications that uh, Saccharia bacteria ha have an, Im an impact on the incidence of periodontitis and are involved in uh, reducing, as I believe, um, bone loss due to inflammation, associated with inflammation. So that's the work of others. I think it just points very clearly to the need to study these organisms in more detail and the need for um, information about um, the mechanisms by which they associate with their hosts and impact the human. But the question I'm going to talk about for a little while is um, where do they come from, how do they get there, and uh, what comes along with these migrations. So we've got data where we can find these organisms in a variety of environments. We've got the genomes in, of the organisms in the mouth, for example, or the gut, we can ask what changes in gene content were they and when do those changes in gene content occur and how often have these migrations taken place. So we're just beginning to build this picture, but I think it's a very interesting um, topic area for understanding evolution of microbes and the human microbiome. So this is a phylogenetic tree on the left from a paper by one of my recently graduated PhD students, Alex Jaffe. Um, it shows the three groups that occur in the human body routinely, abscondida bacteria, glossilia bacteria, and the much more widely sampled Saccharia bacteria. This tree is coded in colors that indicate the environment from which these organisms were derived. And the, the take-home picture from the, the three um, segments of this tree will be shown um, in the next slide and in the slide on the right. We can see um, in this red-brown color the lineages of organisms that are in the human body. And we can see that they're related to each other in clades. But that in the case of gracilli bacteria, there are several clades suggesting to us that there were several migration events into the human from natural environments. And if we look at the flanking um, coding, we can see that most likely these were aqueous, probably freshwater environments. The data for abscondida bacteria are actually really slender. We don't really have enough data to say very much, but at the moment there's just one group of uh, abscondida bacteria that's found in the human mouth. Now I note here that these two groups, abscondida bacteria and gracilli bacteria, use an alternate genetic code. A few bacterial groups do that. I'm not going to talk about that in the context of these organisms, but I will talk about it later in the context of phages. Okay, Saccharia bacteria are much better sampled. In this case, we can see several lineages of animal-associated Saccharia bacteria. And again, generally speaking, the closest related organisms are from the aqueous environment. And it kind of makes sense, really. You could imagine if 
organisms are going to get into the human body, they could very easily come from fresh water, but multiple colonizations. So the next thing we might ask is, well, okay, how do these organisms differ? And the first thing we want to look at is genome size. What comes to light when we look at the genome sizes of these three groups in, um, actually this, is, this one just shows Saccharia bacteria, one of the three groups, in these different habitat types with genome size on the x-axis, this here is proteome size, but basically a proxy for genome size. We have accounted for the fact that many of these genomes are only partial, but even accounting for that, it's pretty clear that the animal-associated organisms have substantially smaller genomes than those that their relatives that occur in the environment. So that might motivate you to ask, what about their metabolic capacities? How do they differ? What is the physiological change that took place once these organisms became animal or human associated? Well, to do this, we're going to use a protein family-based approach, and I'm going to explain it to you before I show you the data. Um, you start with all the predicted proteins from all the genomes, and then you group the proteins together by building hidden Markov model type, um, well, hidden Markov models, and defining some boundaries such that you can group things into families that where the family has a function more or less represents one function. So one family, one function where we know the function. But the good thing about this approach is it doesn't matter if you don't know the function, you still have the sequence. So you can include everything in the analysis. And so we then go genome by genome and we ask, does this protein family, and we're talking maybe 20,000 protein families, does this protein family occur in this genome, yes or no? So this, this plot is going to be a yes-no plot where yes is blue and no is white. And so this is just a two by two, two genomes, two protein families. You can see here we're going to code it, true and false. As we build out now four genomes, three families, we're going to get a sense of where these protein families occur in, across genomes and then by mapping on the environment across environment so that we can correlate function to environment if possible. So the next slide, we're going to zoom way out and we're going to see thousands of protein families and hundreds of genomes. But it's basically set up like this. Okay, so this is what it looks like, and this is um, just for Saccharia bacteria, this particular slide. Again, columns of protein families, presence blue, absence white. The genomes are arranged based on a phylogenetic tree, based on um, an analysis of the sequence of um, phylogenetically informative genes. So right away, you can see that there are some protein families that are widely distributed, if not ubiquitous, across these draft and partially curated and complete genomes. Those are obviously the genes involved in conserved functions, such as ribosome construction, uh, translation, transcription. But we also see groups of protein families that are um, represented by blocks of blue that are seemingly specific to certain environments. And by going in and looking at what the protein families are in the individual cases and in groups of protein families, we start to get a sense of what these proteins do in the case that they are environment specific. And there's not a lot of information in these organisms because well over half the genes have no predicted function. So there's a lot of protein families that have no functional prediction, but we can start to, to identify things like amino acid uptake and CRISPR-Cas, um, systems for phage defense, detoxification, et cetera, that are specific to the human gut associated and human mouth associated organisms. And we can do the reverse. We can identify certain kinds of characteristics of capacities that are absent in human and just as one example would be um, aerobic metabolism. So there are substantial changes in gene content associated with organisms that have colonized the human body. So the next question we can ask is, when did these changes take place? And one possibility is that they preceded migration into the human habitat, or occurred around the time of migration in, in, into the human or occurred continuously after migration. This approach, the approach to analyze this requires that we build trees for every protein family and compare each tree to the phylogenetic tree. And that can be done manually and was done by Alex to some extent manually, but basically that's computationally uh, tractable using 
bioinformatic tools. We use the tool developed by others that's referenced here called the ALE method that basically does this in a kind of probabilistic way and um, renders inferences. And this is an example um, of the kinds of results you can get. These are um, dots that are coded for probability that indicate the inferred time of acquisition of gains, so very few gains actually, or loss of proteins, or protein families more accurately. So from this, it would appear, the analysis of the details of these kinds of patterns would appear that the gene losses did not precede or co-occur with migration into the human body, but probably took place continuously after the transition. So we can answer a couple of questions or begin to answer a couple of questions for these groups. And those um, answers would be that the, the um, habitat transitions were probably not accompanied by a huge change in genome that occurred around the transition time, but rather continuously over time post-colonization. And that the colonization events probably happened multiple times and most likely from groundwater associated lineages. So the CPR are just one example of this, but there are other examples we can turn to to see if the pattern holds up in other lineages. And I think these are interesting groups because they're not the ones most people work on in the human microbiome. So I'm really focusing on CPR and these two next, next examples. The next example is actually not a candidate phylum. It's called Eleusimicrobia, and I think there's a couple, maybe three isolates at this present time. There are Mark gene analyses that indicate there's great diversity of these things, and, and only recently have we been able to add genomes for most of what are inferred to be the major lineages. But it's the same kind of question. Well, first of all, let me just say the top here indicates the placement of Lucy microbia if you're interested in where it falls in the tree. The closest known group that you may be familiar with might be Baruca microbia, a conventional phylum. Um, here, we've collapsed all these down and we've just opened up the Eleusi microbial radiation. The different lineages are colored here on the tree and numbered, but the main point I want to get across now is the environment of origin of these genomes. And now we have a big sampling of the genomes. We can compare the, the organisms that have come from the natural environments to the ones that are in the human um, slash animal associated environments. And we code the animal associated ones in the outer ring in orange and then just, for example, the groundwater in blue. So from this, we can see by just focusing on the orange that there are at least two major groups of Eleusi microbia that occur in the human environment, and indicating that there's been at least two migration events, two lineages have diversified into the, into the animal habitat, and the closest flanking groups are groundwater. We can also look at the gene content of the Eleusi microbia from the animal associated groups and the ones that have best, had been best studied really are these human, a couple of human associated groups represented by isolates, these two. We can make a list of the functions that we expect to find and we do find in genomes and we can compare that set of functions and basically the take home point with the blue shading indicates environmental samples, the white are the human associated ones, that there's a substantial loss in metabolic diversity associated with the human microbiome colonization, which is really not surprising, I suppose, because it's a much more maybe nutrient rich and um, controlled environment. The third group, actually the first group we studied, were originally reported as cyanobacteria associated with the human gut. And when most of us heard there was say anobacteria in the human gut, you think, what the is going on here? Um, can that be true? And so I actually met Ruth Lay, who was one of the people who did a lot of marker gene analysis in the early days of human microbiome research. And she told me about these cyanobacteria, and she said they'd tried to get single cell genomes and they couldn't get anything. I'm like, how abundant are they? She said 1%. This goes back, I don't know, early 2000s. I said, oh, 1%, no problem get us some samples and we'll get the genomes. And actually, we did actually get genomes and we actually got three, I think, three complete genomes. It, uh, Itai Sharon did the genomics. Um, and we could address the question of what they were doing in the human gut. Well, it turns out, and I'm just putting some, a little bit here about why people might care about it. It's not my focus today. It turns out that they're not photosynthetic. And actually, if you look at the phylogeny, I think most people agree that they're not cyanobacteria, though at the moment, people's perspective on 
the lineage structure of the tree is changing um, pretty ra radically. These are the cyanobacteria. This is this new group we call the melanobacteria. And you can see here the capacity for photosynthesis is indicated by a green dot completely missing. So it would appear that these organisms are actually fermentative. They're fermenting in the gut and pretty distinctive, interestingly basal to the cyanobacteria, one of the basal lineages. There are two other basal lineages also known only from genomes and metagenomes, and they are also fermentation-based metabolisms for the most part with a lot of hydrogen metabolism involved. But that's really, I think, mostly from, interesting from the perspective of evolution of photosynthesis, or oxygenic photosynthesis. We can put together the kind of information we get from genomes and metagenomes to render a cartoon, a cell cartoon. I don't expect you to read this, I understand it, but I just want to show that all the genes and pathways, particularly if you've got a a, a genome that's really high quality or complete can be used to do a reconstruction of the metabolism. And um, this is the kind of way we present it. We, you'll find these very commonly also in isolate genome papers. So it's basically very analogous to the kind of rendering of data that we would use there. So we can do the same kind of analysis. We can ask about protein families. We can ask about um, environmental origin. These are lines. Uh, rows are genomes, um, they're grouped by environment, and then the columns are capacities. And this is a slightly different way of presenting the data. The genome completeness, one in a box means it's got one marker gene, which is what we'd expect. So they're all really good quality genomes. Pretty clearly, the genetic capacities uh, of the gut associated um, melanobacteria, the cyanobacteria relatives, are pretty substantially less than those of their environmental counterparts, again pointing to this idea of gene repertoire loss and genome reduction associated with human colonization. Okay, I want to talk to, to you about phages because I've been very interested in bacteriophages, the viruses of bacteria, for quite a while. And actually, um, some of the most interesting ones turn out to be the ones from the human microbiome. So I want to start out by saying, first of all, that if you look at the average size of phage genomes in public data, at least when we did it in 2019, it was 55 KB, which is pretty tiny. But when we were working on a particular cohort of individuals from Bangladesh, it came to light that there were some really huge genomes in there, much bigger than we had really expected. And uh, all of these were, were manually curated to completion, and they're all over 200 KB. This is just from a handful of, of um, in, it's actually a handful of individual subjects. But the biggest are the most interesting, perhaps. Those are around four, 540, and some are a little larger now, um, kilobase pairs, so half a megabase. So roughly 10 times bigger than expected, based on public data. So let's take a look at these two genomes, or the group of genomes that these two genomes represent. Um, because they are so distinctive, we gave them a name, a name, and the name comes from the name of the village where these subjects were recruited, human subjects, and so we call them the LAC phages. So these are the first two clades, A1 and A2. And let's take a little bit of a look at these. But first of all, let me just ask, why does it matter that phages have large genomes? Well, first of all, it's not expected. So there's got to be something interesting there. It's a different way of being for a phage. Um, we might anticipate, because of their substantial genetic repertoires, they may behave differently during infection. People have suggested maybe they, they don't actually really do anything. They just hang out almost like a plasmid. We don't know that to be the case. Their large cargo capacities is potentially um, medically relevant as well as biologically relevant from the perspective of their um, I don't want to say lifestyles, but existence styles. And I would just note that um, the medical uh, importance associated with being able to transport many genes may come about through the ability to move antibiotic resistance genes and virulence factors. And I think most people don't think about phage spread of disease between animal and human reservoirs because they're all focused on viruses of eukaryotes, right? Zoonoses. Well, I think there's actually a kind of parallel phenomenon that may be possible here in the case where the phages carry in pathogenicity or factors or, or toxins that then make the microbes um, pathogenic. And this is just a little list of um, diseases that are introduced 
into humans by that mechanism. So it's actually a pretty good list. And so this raises a question that I think is pretty understudied at this point, is could migration of phages from animals into the human microbiome actually be a mechanism for transfer of disease? And I partly maybe can answer a little bit of why that might not be as true as I'd originally thought um, in the coming slides. So the next question we have is, well, OK, we've got these huge phage in the human microbiome. What do they replicate in? And the answer, as informed by CRISPR space and matching, I won't go into the details, is very clearly Prevotella. So Prevotella is in these stacked bar charts. The Prevotella representation is shown in this gold color. So you can see in these humans, Prevotella is the most abundant um, genus. And these individual little blocks within the bar are actual um, genomes, so different species, many different species of Prevotella. Well, one of the things that caught our eye immediately upon seeing these huge genes, genomes, I beg your pardon, is the fact that when we predicted the genes, the predictions just look completely wrong. So normally, bacterial genomes, phage genomes have about 90% plus coding density, so the intergenic regions are a small part. And these had up to 50% in the genetic regions, which pretty much tells you something wrong. Moreover, genes that you would have expected to um, be made of these two parts were fragmented, suggesting that something was wrong in the gene calling. And the answer, as has also been seen in the CPR bacteria I mentioned, a couple of other bacterial types, and in one prior study by Natalia Ivanova, in you know, a big survey JGI did, is that the phages use an alternate genetic code. And it's not completely mysterious. It's just simply that a stop codon has been reassigned to code for amino acid. And so when we tell the program that this particular stop codon, which I'm just going to refer to as TAG or UAG if you prefer, is not really a stop codon. It's an amino acid. And when we tell the program that and we do the gene predictions, you can see we recover good coding density and full protein predictions. So pretty clearly, the code of the Prevotella and of the phage that infects it, this phage that infects it, or this group of phages, is different, which raises all sorts of interesting questions when it comes to translations. So you've got one ribosome and you've got two genetic codes feeding in. How does that work and why would that be the case? So just to make that really clear, a stop codon is now read through and an amino acid is incorporated. So the next question might be, what amino acid? Now, I should say there's three stop codons, as I'm sure you realize, TAG, TGA, TAA. It turns out that we've never found, to my knowledge, nobody's ever found TAA reassigned, but both TAG and TGA can be reassigned. So it can just code for an amino acid. So we can make alignments of the various sequences of these phages, and by looking at the um, amino acid that's coded for in the position that's now reading in a way that we would think to mean stop, we can figure out that the, the UAG is translated as glutamine. So when we look at the distribution of reassigned stop codons across the genomes, one thing that became really obvious in these lac phages is that it's really heterogeneous. Some genes have no reassigned codon, others have many. And if we look at the categories of genes that have many stop codons, it's all the structural proteins and late stage proteins. I'll come back to that in a moment. So we asked, well, where do we find these lac phages? And it turns out it's where we find certain kinds of Prevotella. Prevotella is a, really a marker, I think, of the non-Western diet, human microbiome. In Western diet, it's normally the Bacteroides um, genus of Bacteroidetes. In the US, we find almost none, and we find them in um, hunter the lac phages and Prevotella in baboons, in um, hunter-gatherer communities, in children from um, India and cholera-impacted Bangladeshis, and so on and so forth. So we asked then, okay, let's look at lac phages more broadly. And so we deliberately collected a ton of different um, animal microbiome samples and made a phylogenetic tree in, in which we represent each um, genome as a branch. And we code the branches by organism of origin, so animal organism of origin. We can see here, for example, that in this branch on the right, we have many green and yellow dots. These are all baboon-associated organisms. 
Here, interestingly enough, we have um, green and pink and blue, which are a mixture of humans and quite distantly related organisms, which would be um, pigs and horses, so domesticated animals. Um, by the way, the largest genome is now 660 KB, so for a human-associated um, organism. We can ask now the same kind of question about protein families by making exactly the kind of, same kind of array I showed you before, but here coding presence is gray. We can see that there are groups of protein families that are specific to phages that are found in different microbiome types. So, for example, we can put boxes around protein families that are specific to pigs, and then protein families that are specific to all baboons and some kinds of baboons and other kinds of baboons. So this actually tells us that probably, if not immediately upon migration, over time after migration of the phages and probably the bacterial hosts into these new or different animal microbiomes, there's been pretty substantial changes in gene capacities. So. I think I'm going to skip this slide in the order of time, but I'll just put it up there just and say very briefly that these large phages are not rare, and alternative coding is not rare. And the next study I'm going to talk about briefly will be a larger analysis of alternately coded phages, not just limited to LAC. So lots of, this is just 10 samples, lots and lots of instances of big genomes and alternate coded phages that are quite abundant. So we conducted a study published recently by um, Adair Borges et al, in which we basically surveyed animal and human microbiomes, and we um, basically classified each of the phage genomes based on whether or not TAG or TAG, TAG or TGA was reassigned. And we find both, and we find that the genomes have quite a wide distribution of length, so it's not just associated with big genomes, and that it varies um, quite a bit and it's varying very substantially more prevalent in humans with a non-Western diet compared to Western diet. So I won't go into this in detail, but this is a phylogenetic tree that basically on the outside is decorated with bars that indicate genome length. So again, you can see substantial differences in um, genome length. And shown in the colors here, just as these blocks of colors are the different clades. So take on point, we find four distinct families of alternatively recoded bacteriophages that affect bacteroides, plus four that affect firmicutes. So this is a much broader phenomena than might have been in indicated by my one introductory study of the lac phages. Um, what's even more interesting, I think, is this result illustrated here where we have closely related phages, so falling closely together on the tree, that have yellow, gray, and green code. That means standard code, TGA reassigned, TAG reassigned, telling us that phages that can be closely, closely related can use different genetic codes. This is not something that we expected. There's another example here. Um, so overall, between two and six percent of the phages we found in the human microbiome use an alternate genetic code. So it's not really, really common, but it's certainly not rare and probably still under-recognized. So expanding on this just a tiny bit more, the different clades, different groups of phages are illustrated by the rows, the blocks, and the colored balls indicate the kind of recoding. So again, very closely related phages can use different genetic codes. This is an example where we've done whole genome alignments, which you can only do with closely related genomes. And here is 90% average nucleotide identity. As we can see here, there's interspersing of TGA recoded phages and standard code phages. When we align the genomes, you can align the whole genomes here as shown below, we find again, it's structural and actually lysis proteins that have accumulated these in-frame stop codons, what would be stop codons if read in the normal way. And what's perhaps even more interesting is that the stop codon that's been reassigned here is almost not used in the standard code phage. So it would appear that a precursor for code, and this is more generally true by the way, precursor for code switch is probably reduction in use of the codon that's been reassigned. Another driver appears to be low GC. So low GC, stop codon avoidance, and the, and the code can switch. 
So this tells us the genetic code is evolutionally much more dynamic than ex at least I really expected. Um, we think that the reassignment of stop codons may be important in terms of the process of infection and successful infection by the phages for the following reasons. We see that many of the phages encode some machinery known to be required for code switch. These require a, this involves a tRNA that can recognize the stop codon. In some cases, we can identify an amino acyl tRNA synthetase and also release factors that would recognize the pairs of stop codons. We think that during the early part of infection, the genome is read with code 11, the host bacterial code. And then the phage manages to produce this code switch machinery, and now it flips the ribosome so that it reads the stop codon as the amino acid of choice. And we think, but this is a speculation, we need to do experiments to, to, to validate this, that possibly this is because it's really important that the phage not prematurely produce the proteins involved in lysis and structural proteins. And so it may just be an insurance policy for that reason. I want to say that the alternate coded phages are not only lytic, all the big phages appear to be lytic as far as we know, but we've been able to identify incorporated into the genome, in other words, prophage, that use the alternate genetic code. So this is just two examples, one in the Prevotella genome, it's quite small, co whoops, small phages, and um, likewise in a Firmicute genome. So we can pick this out very easily because the, the normal gene predictions give you such low coding density. So both lytic phages and prophages are functioning in this way. So the last piece of work is not um, published yet. It's done with our collaborators, long-term collaborators who do proteomics. We've provided them with human microbiome samples that contain abundant alternatively coded phages, and they've been able to confirm the bioinformatic prediction that the stop codon reads as, in this case, glutamine. This is, it was actually hard for us to figure out when we first saw the LAC phages because we went to NCBI and looked at the listing of all the genetic codes that exist in biology. It took us a while to realize that it goes 14, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16. So there is a code 15, and when I contacted NIH and I said, hey, by the way, <laughs> there is a code 15 that they told me has never been seen in biology, but hopefully now we have proteomic ver verification, not just bioinformatics, we can fix the listing. So I tell you, 15, code 15 really does exist, I think, very clearly now, and this is just a diagram of the two phages that were studied with the asterisks indi indicating where there is proteomic confirmation that T TAG equals glutamine. So I think it's a good time to wrap up, given the hour. Um, I wanted to make a few conclusions. Um, I, first of all, want to back out and say again that there's a lot in the human microbiome that would be missed by cultivation-dependent approaches um, and in the environment more broadly, of course, as well. Um, they're now known to some extent, through genome-resolved metagenomics. There's a lot we can predict, a lot we still don't know. Many of these organisms may have medical significance, and the, and the evidence is emerging from the studies of others that they do. As I said, we're interested in where do they come from, how does the environment in impact human microbiome development. We think that they, given the late appearance of humans, must have come from the environment, and probably they came from groundwater, Colonization was probably accidental at first, but over time, an evolution of the association, there were changes in the gene repertoires, mostly associated with loss of capacities and genome reduction. I think it's really important we keep our eyes on not just the microbes, but their um, associated phage, bacteriophages, viruses. Um, we see closely related phages in not very closely related organisms. And we see not so closely related phages in closely related organisms. For example, humans and baboons, the phages are very different. Humans and dogs and horses, they seem to be much closer. So association may be important in terms of acquisition of phages and their bacterial um, hosts into the human microbiome. I personally find that this topic of alternate coding 
of phage is really fascinating. I can't tell you why it's going to be important yet. But I know actually the person I sat next to on the plane coming out here was, runs a nonprofit in Oakland on phage therapy. And she was going to a conference where she's going to convene a section on successful implementation of phage therapy trials and so forth. And I think that there may be some reason to look at the genetic code and how it can be used by phages to just add that little bit more um, probability of successful infection. And perhaps more broadly, evolutionary speaking, I think a really fascinating phenomenon that's come to light through genomes, from metagenomes for phages, is the idea that the phage can switch their code very easily. The code switch is very facile. It's not fixed. It's not static. Probably it can switch probably one way and back again. There are obvious components of the mechanism of, of code adaptation, but I'm sure there will be a lot more to learn as we start to get alternate phages into culture. So why have we not done the experiments already? There is, to my knowledge, no alternatively coded phage in pure culture, in culture, um, at least not one published to this day. So I'm going to just put up a quick acknowledgement slide. I want to thank, obviously, our funding sources, which include the National Institutes of Health and um, some other organizations. I listed publications throughout, but the people whose names here are, with one exception, Joanne Santini at the top, all members or past members of my lab. And then we've been really lucky to work a little bit with members of the Forsyth Institute on the TM7 Sakai bacteria. So thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions. I'm going to start with one from, uh, from, from online. The appearance of a group of symb um, symbionts that have lost uh, aerobic metabolism raised this question. I have always thought that the original mitochondrion was engulfed when it uh, contained all oxfos capability. Do you see evidence that those original organisms, quote unquote, may have already lost most ETC proteins, i.e., are there nascent new mitochondria out there as symbionts? Oh, I love this question. But first of all, it's a bit backwards. ETC, I take it, means electron transport chain, and there are metabolism, those go together. Um, I think it's actually the opposite. I think that the um, organisms in soil probably gain the capacity for aerobic metabolism. It's not actually that well re represented at this time. Um, and mostly they're soil-associated organisms. I think the vast majority of these organisms, these CPR organisms, are anaerobes. And that seems to be the normal mode of life in Earth's environments where they occur and in the human body. So I don't know about the, and I don't think the analogy with mitochondria is quite appropriate in this case. I think it's more like another kind of organism organism association, so on the continuum of, of you know, endosymbiosis, which would be the mitochondrion, and loose association in microbial communities. This is a case where they have direct physical contact or episymbiosis. And I think that's an evolved strategy. I think it's a very common strategy, and it's extremely understudied. But I don't think it's analogous quite in that way. Um. Hi, uh, thank you for the lecture. My question is about uh, lack of phages, because you said that they can be really variable in the genome size, but it also means that they have to be able to pack this genome in the capsid. And as you shown on one of the trees, that some of them like really, like some subgroups really vary in the genome size as others are not. Do you see any difference in the capsids or like proteins that form those capsids? I think by way of clarification, I want to say I talked about two things. I talked about LAC phages first, and their genome sizes range from 465 KB to 660. So it's not a huge range in size, but it's lineage specific. So there's a few major lineages of LAC phages. So I think there's no big mystery with the capsids. Um, we can identify the capsid proteins, but you know, so they've evolved different sizes, but the sizes aren't hugely different, and closely related lac phages have the same size. What I showed you in terms of the huge range in genome size are all alternatively coded phages. Okay. And in that case, they've got different hosts, they're different types of phages, they're just all over the tree. And so I'm sure there probably would be differences in the capsid no. proteins, but I haven't looked at that in detail. 
but I mean, you have some closely related groups that vary in size. Yes, for for alternative, the one with alternative. So the, for the closely yeah. related group, how you explain that they can pack these genes? Oh uh, yeah, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. So I mean, that's a pretty zoomed out view of the tree, and I, I don't know how really very closely related they are. But yes, it tends to be and I'm pretty sure about this, that closely related phages have the same genome size. So if we find one large phage, we find a clade of them. And actually, that's what we titled the paper, Clades of Huge Phage Across Earth's Environments. Um, so one, you find them all big. And more distantly branching, we find the smaller ones. So I don't, I, I, I don't know anything beyond that in terms of the mechanism, but I think it's quite a bit of evolutionary time that separates them. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yeah. Susan, go ahead. All right. <laughs> so lots, lots of exciting things. Let me let me start with one back. Um, when you were showing the acquisition or loss of mm. meta met metabolic things in, in sort of independent events, it looked like they were in groups as if there's not a capacity that must be gained when you go from right. the environment, that you can do it many different ways and it's not, you know, that you must get something in particular. Is that? I accurate? think that's fair, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fact that they, they can be quite, quite I mean, we, these, these are phylum level views. So if we say branch here that's now got relatives yeah. that are human yeah. associated here, those are really different organisms. Yeah. So different starting points. And I, I do think it's really, as best as the data shows so far, continuous modification, sure. not one requisite. Thing that you gain, start yeah. with. Yeah. In the case of the lac phages, it's really interesting that what stands out is the gains. Yeah. In yeah. the case of the microbes, it's more the, oops, the loss, loss of diversity, really, diversity of capacities. Maybe what you can do more easily. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> or, or what you yeah. don't need to do, you shed. Right. Yeah, right. once you're in a human body, I think it's really different to being in an aquifer or a sediment or something. Yeah. 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 I think you've asked the question. No. <laughs> There's, there's nothing, yeah, no, there's, uh, I just had a comment on mine, not a question. Okay, so let, let me, I, I really love the, the alternate translation of code, oh, good. too. That's, that's really fascinating. But, of course, in the model in which, so the phages are carrying the, the machinery to do that. For the most part. And you think those are sort of early genes that are coming in, but not only are they going to affect when the phage can make those lytic ones, but they're going to do strange things to the host, too. And do you see any, in, I mean, I guess you need one that doesn't do it and one that does to know whether the, whether the host has adapted at all. In terms I have of two huge questions, and this is a really interesting yeah. question. I think that, um, well, we just don't know. Are all the ribosomes switched? Is it just a subset? Is it a complete switch? Yeah. There's a lot of questions there. What we could look for peptides that are terminated and classify them as terminated phage proteins and terminated host proteins because we can you know once we have the genomes cultivation independent really we can predict the protein sequences and then we can predict the peptides and we can validate them so that's what we really need to do is to to ask that question do they make the terminated the prematurely terminated bacterial proteins and then the one question I would ask on top of that is does the host bacteria have a way of switching the ribosome back. Right. Because based on the other things we know about this kind of, you know, interaction, phageous interaction, I bet there's a way that the bacteria goes, no, you don't. And, and, and we, we, nobody's done, nobody has the, the resources yet to do the experiments. I, I think you could do some of it with cultivation independent. We just never had the resources to do it. Yeah. Okay. One more. Uh, no, there's one more online. This question is from our, uh, from our colleague, Hector Romero. Hello, this was a fascinating talk. I've worked with bacteriophages in the past and have also been really interested in the ways that bacteriophages from the same cluster can vary in the ways they achieve hmm. lysogeny? Lysogeny? Yeah. Okay. For example, there are bacteriophages that infect the same host species, but one might infect through lysis, uh, the other prefer integrate. Yep. Do you think that the differences in the integration mechanisms used by bacteriophages is also related to alterations from the environmental associations? I, I really don't 
have a response to that. Hmm. Um, I don't either. I, I, I think that's a tough question. It's an interesting possibility, but I, I don't think there's any data to really hmm. speak from in response. And, and one more that we can wrap up? Sure, please. So thank you, that was really great. Um, I just was wondering to follow up on Susan's question, given that you're finding a lot of Prevotella mm -hmm. where the lacophages are, does that maybe suggest that the Prevotella is finding a way to resist or survive those phages? Like, I mean, it seems to be the dominant species, so maybe it's found a way to sort of. Great question, I get you, yeah. Um, yes, the answer is actually, we, well, first of all, let me uh, go back to how we identified Prevotella as the host for the LAC. And the answer is spacer targeting, so CRISPR spacers, that's immunity. But we never found the CRISPR spacers that confer immunity in the same microbiomes that we find the LAC phage, which is actually a more gen. We use CRISPR spacer targeting to do first host phage linkages for 10 more years. This is actually the normal pattern. Um, the, Prevotella that have the lac phages have died, most probably, been predated before the lac phages appeared. And we have time series data too, so we have four consecutive day samples. So the lac phages are really changing in abundance very quickly. These are very dynamic systems. So I would say no immunity, lac phages prevalent. Immunity, we don't find the lac phages. It's only going across those two sample sets we can make the connection. So the immunity is at least by CRISPR, maybe other mechanisms as well. But we don't know the lifestyle other than there's no evidence that they integrate, that they, they never become prophage, as best as we can see for any of these. I don't think there's any huge phages that we know that they do that, and certainly none lack. So whether, as I said, whether they just hang around and they're somehow beneficial to the host in a way that makes them more like a plasmid, I think that's on the table still. So how, how defensive the private has to be is also in question. Thanks for the questions. That's good. wonderful. I guess we're su we're supposed to finish up because we've we've hit the hour. <laughs> Lots to talk about. Remind everyone here and online that there will be a Lambda Lunch Chapter Two tomorrow, and contact Susan Gottesman if you need the link. And thank you so much for coming. It's been wonderful, a lot of fun, and lots of things to, to keep talking about. So. Thank you. Thanks for the questions.